chicken. I'm your guy. Blinking. I don't have what Joseph has. Look, somebody's talking about you. This is what we call the voice of God. Mm. Popping. Everybody just gets to focus on you. Grab me. Probably not the best thing for an introvert. I'm asking for you. Well, I like a good chicken sandwich. Touch me. Hi, David. Comment. Oh my God. Like. You're actually an identical twin. Push. Maybe I'll just ask Julie to talk about what it is to no. be an identical twin. Pick me up. No, you didn't. Shouting. Surprise. I Jeremiah, just hang on a second. I just got a text. There's an edit for your new opening, Joseph. I, I feel really honored to have been here, man. You. But by the way, you've done a masterful job. Seriously. And it was such a joy. Thanks, Joseph. It's an honor. Good on you. This was a pleasure. I mean, you are a, the a prime example of how to pivot in this new environment. I wish everybody gets an opportunity to interact with Joseph Jaffe and Corona TV. Who needs cameo when I've got my own <laughs> personal cameo? <laughs> yes, I'm wearing that shirt again. You have to understand about me that the more you tell me not to do something, the more I'm going to do it. The more you tell me how ugly this shirt is, the more I'm going to wear it. I love the shirt. It's my Nelson Mandela, my Mediva shirt. And it's what you should be wearing on, on this island, on this beautiful oasis uh, at which or on which I sit uh, right now. Welcome aboard. What does welcome aboard mean? Well, you're going to see uh, soon enough. But, but first of all, Murray Nossel is watching. Thanks for the acknowledgement, Joseph. I loved being on your show let me tell you something, Murray. I loved you being on my show much more than you enjoyed being on my show. Or we can call it a push or a tie. Uh, and today, uh, today is actually unprecedented. It's the first time two people from the same company are coming on the show in 170 appearances. And I could not think of a better person or a better company, as I said to him in, uh, in, the, uh, in the green room. Uh, Tom says, love the shirt, which now means that I have to take the shirt off, not in front of you. It's reverse psychology, Tom. I know what you're doing. You are a mean, mean, sadistic philosopher, my friend. And uh, and I don't know who LinkedIn user is, but they said, great intro piece. Thank you. It makes me feel really, really good. It makes me smile. That's why I do this. Um, so today is actually Festivus. So happy Festivus from the rest of us uh, to all of you. And if you don't know what Festivus is, well, I'm technically, it's a secular holiday celebrated on December 23rd as an alternative to the pressures and commercialism of the Christmas season. But really, that's not what Festivus is at all. Festivus is definitely uh, and was made famous by, uh, by Seinfeld. Uh, so a little hat tip to George Costanza and to the cast and characters of uh, Seinfeld. Uh, Mr. Chip Griffin says, keep the shirt on. Uh, now, again, is that reverse psychology? I don't know, but I'm going to take you uh, at your word quite literally, uh, my friend. Uh, do not worry. Do not stray nor go away. Uh, Stephen Rubin is here, and he's watching. Good to have you here, uh, Stephen. And uh, tomorrow, maybe you'll be here too, because uh, Seth Godin and Philip Kotler will be celebrating my 50th birthday with me, and I thank them very much for spending New Year's Eve uh, with this little streamer that is Joseph Jaffe and Corona TV. But today we are focused on Jerome DeRoy. He is the CEO of Narrative, and we're going to talk about listening, or we're going to maybe not talk about listening, we're going to listen about listening. Uh, we are going to talk about stories, and we're going to talk about a very specific use case, which is employee engagement, and specifically this idea of, of onboarding. What an interesting uh, specialized way to think about it. But first, let me wish my uh, twins, or my almost twins, I should say, uh, happy birthday because, you know, you're just one day apart from me, aren't you? Uh, Lisa Joss Chimes, Kate O'Neill, I have to have her on the show at some point as well. Thomas Morelli, uh, Jody Honig, uh, Tally Weiss, Terry Fallis, and then, of course, Gerhard Lowe, Brandon Roten, Shane Brady, uh, and my buddy in South Africa, Wayne Brett, or as I like to call him, Waynos. Happy birthday, Waynos, to you. Well, today's seated soliloquy, as always, is connected in some way, shape, or form uh, to my guest, uh, and it's called, very simply put, First Impressions. 
this is the last soliloquy that I'm writing or delivering before I turn 50. So I was thinking, should I reflect on the first half century of my life or begin to talk about the next? Well, the answer is neither. I'm just going to keep going like I did yesterday and like I'm going to do tomorrow. Today, my guests and I are going to talk about employee onboarding amongst other uh, ideas and, and themes. It sounds so innocuous and almost trivial. Why is this even important? How do you create an entire show, let alone an entire business, around this topic? And then it hit me. This is about something much bigger. It's about first impressions. And as the saying goes, you don't get a second chance to make a good first impression. So why do so many companies suck at this? Or, or do they? I actually wouldn't know as I haven't been a corporate guy since 2002, but here's one thing that I do know. It can't be easy to onboard an employee in 2020 in the age of COVID. Not even Room Rater can help with this one. And that's a little inside joke there for the regulars. This year, I actually put together and hosted a completely customized and branded Corona TV episode for a corporate client and their employees. I got to welcome the CEO and select employees from a newly acquired company to the larger parent. This was actually the first time that they'd been introduced. And I'm happy to say, I think the non-traditional delivery mechanism and experience was different and meaningful. We got to see the personalities of the people and moreover, the culture of the company and a preview of the fit or mesh within the group. First impressions matter. And I wonder why companies are so complacent at kicking off what could be a long, enduring and mutually beneficial, not to mention productive and financially lucrative relationship on the front foot. Customer relationships are actually no different. In the case of sales, so much effort and energy gets put into the chase, the traditional funnel of awareness, interest, desire, and action. And then when it comes to the customer onboarding component, or what I would call the beginning of the flip funnel of acknowledgement, dialogue, incentivization, and activation, crickets. You don't get a second chance to make a good first impression, but you do get a second chance to make a great second impression. So let's use this opportunity, 2020 or however you want to talk about it, to reconnect, rededicate, and renew the relationships in our lives that count. I'll even give you a place to start. Anniversaries and birthdays. See, I ended up at the place that I started. Well, now it's time to welcome my guest today, Jerome. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of background, uh, as always, about him. But first, as I often do, let's make this about him and not me. Jerome DeRoy joined Narrative in 2007 after the founders, Murray Nossel and Paul Brody, handed him a shoebox full of notes and said, we think there's a company in here. For the last 13 years, Jerome has worked closely with clients to craft business-relevant personal stories for sales, leadership, and team building. He regularly lectures at Parsons New School of Design in New York City on the art of storytelling. Two years ago, the light bulb went off. Jerome saw that storytelling could offer a unique enhancement to a company's onboarding process, role clarity, mission and values, and creating a sense of belonging are all well within the scope of impact from stories. And here's the story that inspired Jerome to act. Twenty years ago, I graduated from business school and started a job in finance in Hong Kong. On my first day, the HR director greeted me and said, welcome. And then she sat me down and we watched a training video that I'm pretty sure dated from the 1980s. She handed me two binders, one that said compliance and the other one, quite thick, said employee handbook. Then she said, I'd like you to go through these two binders in the next 48 hours, please. After my first day, I had gotten through the compliance one. After a week, I still didn't know what was expected of me or how the company put their values to work on a day-to-day -day basis. Four years later, I quit my job.
I, I love the fact that that everyone has their own employee onboarding story. Uh, yeah, that was yours. Well, welcome <laughs> to the show. Joy. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me, and and uh, welcome everyone to the show. It's great, uh, great to be here. So we're going to move through lots of backgrounds today, from the uh, welcome aboard Tropical Island to uh, Zoom Hell, which yeah. is our background. And I uh, guess yes, we'll move through uh, that that horrible employee handbook. Learn it, memorize it. Uh, you know, there will be a test, um, and I'm sure where we'll end up is the same background that I used when Murray was on the show, which is mm. the power of the of uh, storytelling around the campfire. Um, but before we do any of that, uh, let's talk some fun facts and find out about some other stories associated with you. Uh, mm. And I have to say, like this one, this one is <laughs> this one is a crazy, crazy story. <laughs> but I'm sure you can tell it in your own uh, unique way. Um, yeah. It involves your maternal grandmother passing away, a genealogy mm -hmm. book that you found. It almost sounds like a Harrison Ford type of Indiana Jones uh, prelude, uh, including someone getting shot over a poker game. So why don't you tell us that story? Yes. <laughs> well, I was reminded of that story. Well, first of all, you asked me about fun facts, but I'm, I'm currently in Florida right now visiting family. I've been here for uh, three weeks and uh, will be here for another Month and a month and a half for you know thanks to that's one of the silver linings about COVID is I can do my work anywhere, and so I chose to be closer to family because we have an eight month old and uh, she still hasn't met her grandparents. So here I am, and the other day I was walking through my parents' home and I saw this portrait of this guy with these piercing blue eyes. I mean you know it's a black and white picture, and he's wearing this overcoat looks heavy, and then next to him is this very severe looking woman. With a with a kind of a quaff and you know and I look at it and I'm sort of like wow that looks like it's from the 18th century and and so I asked my mother about it and she reminded me of that story uh, right this was like two days ago right before you asked me about this and uh, and the story goes that on my mother's side so, side so that guy who was on that portrait that was Monroe Short uh, and he was like a great 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 grandfather I think um, on my mother's side. And, and there was a, another short named James, and his son, the story goes that in the late 1700s, his son banished him from, from their, not just from their home, but from their town. And the story goes that the reason he banished him is that he had had one too few uh, at the saloon, uh, and, uh, and apparently there was a poker game. And I imagine in my mind, because I watched Westerns all the time when I was a kid, you know, the guy sort of flipping the table over and getting a gun out and saying, you cheated me and then shot him. Because apparently that's what James Short did. He shot someone uh, at a poker game and came back home. And his son said, this has happened too many times. Put him on a horse and slapped the horse's ass and, uh, and said, you know, you go now. <laughs> and that was the last we saw of James Short. And a few, many, many years ago, I went to, this is all taking place in Mississippi where most of that part of the family came from. And, and many years ago, we did a tour of Mississippi with my mother, and we actually found the grave site of the, of the son, uh, and, and his name was Monroe Short, and there it was on a tiny little tombstone, and his name was there, and, uh, and that was his father, James. So that's the story, that's where I come from. Wow, <laughs> and, and, and uh, Chip says, you haven't really played poker until someone gets shot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I, I guess this is the time in the show when you basically say, and that entire story was completely made up, but just to prove the power of stories. That's right. Now you're with me. I can tell you it was made up. <laughs> so, so here's another interesting factoid about you, which is you inherited a stalker from someone that you were subletting from. Yes. And uh, we actually have, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> oh my God, it's so an, an image of you and the stalker. Um, I'm sure your wife may not, um, but, but tell us, tell us that story. Yeah. Well, so I, shortly after I arrived in New York city back in 2003, uh, my sister connected me with someone who was looking for a, a subletter for their, uh, for their apartment. And, uh, and so I met the guy and he was an actor and he was going to go to Brazil for a month. And so he was very 
happy to find someone to sublet his apartment. And after about a week, I was started getting these calls in the middle of the night. And uh, on the, you know, this was a time when there were still landlines. And so there was a landline and, and the phone kept ringing. So I couldn't just, you know, switch off my cell phone or anything like that. I had to answer the phone for it to stop. And, uh, and every time I'd answer, I'd hear, uh, Marek, Marek, is that you, Marek, where are you? And, uh, and I said, sorry, this is, you got the wrong number. But it kept happening. And finally, I just unplugged the phone because I was like, you know, these phone calls, nobody's going to call me on this phone. Uh, it's for this guy, you know. And the guy's name that I was subletting from, I realized his name was Mark. And Marek was awfully close to Mark, but I didn't give it another thought. And then about a week later, I heard a knock on the door. Now, this is a building where you have to buzz. There's multiple doors to get through. Somehow, someone had gotten through and knocked on the door. And so I kind of carefully looked at, you know, opened the door and kind of looked through the crack. And I saw this short woman with kind of hair, a lot of, almost like uh, she was kind of wearing a, a wig and lots and lots of makeup. Like she looked like a clown almost. And there was this guy next to her who was taller than her, not quite, I'm 6'4". He was a little bit shorter than me. And, and he was, you know, standing next to her and he kind of had like I had a beer belly and they were sort of looking at me nonchalantly. And I said, can I help you? And they said, uh, the woman started to speak and she said, is Marek here? And I immediately recognized the voice from the phone. I said, look, you know, there's no Marek here. I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, no, Marek, Marek. And, Do you mean Mark? Because I'm subletting from Mark. And she said, yes, yes, Marek, Marek. He told me he would call me back. He told me he would. Uh, he was in love with me. And, you know, and now he's never responding to my calls. And, and she went on and on. And the guy next to her never said a word. And I said, look, I'm just subletting. I don't know who you are and what's going on, but he's coming back in a month. And you know maybe you can talk to him then. And so of course I email Mark right away and I say, look, there's you should probably know that in a month someone's going to visit you and it's going to look a little weird. Uh, but she's been calling and hopefully she's not going to call anymore. And then he writes back, you know, pretty soon after, and he said, oh, I see you've met my stalker. Dot dot dot. And he said, you can just ignore her. It's going to be fine. <laughs> and so finally, when he came back to New York City, I asked him, and he said, yeah, it's someone that I met. You know, I'm, I'm an actor. And she basically pretending, pretended to be a director from Hungary and to get me a part. And I thought I would go along. And so I said, OK, well, that's kind of weird. And then she started sending me these uh, these photos of her in lingerie. And I thought, you know, I should probably stop this. So who knows what the true story was there? But anyway, the story goes for me that a few months later, I'd kind of forgotten about this. I was out of this sublet and I was walking down New York City, a New York City street. And I see this woman from afar, you know, exactly the same stocky build. And this time she had a beehive. And next to her was this guy who was completely dressed in drag and has a, had a, a lot of makeup on, et cetera. And as they got closer, I told to my friend, because I, I had told this story a lot, and I said to my friends, you know what? I think that might be that stalker. And I think that's the guy who was with her. And then they walked by. And so I changed sidewalks because I, I didn't want them to risk them recognizing me. And finally, we passed each other. And I turned around. And then she turned around at that moment. And she said, Jerome, my name. And then that was it. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, uh, it's insane. And all I could think of was, you know, uh, w waiter, there's a fly in my soup. And, and then the waiter goes, well, I'm sorry, sir. I'm going to have to charge you extra for that. So I'm wondering whether the lease was 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 uh, premium priced or discounted based on the fact that <laughs> there was added value in the form of a stalker. I did get a very good deal. This was a very nice apartment in East Village, uh, you know, 2003, 2004. So, yeah, I, I think maybe maybe that was part of the deal, you know, the, the unwritten rule is that you'd have to just put up with a stalker. He was hoping that I'd be able to just get rid of his stalker for him, basically. Well, I can't, I can't unhear that story now. So in, uh, I'm just going to have to call you Jerome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jerome yes, or not. Yes. And you have to kind of yell it. That's the way to do it. We're not here, Jerome, to talk about stalkers. We're here to talk about employee handbooks. <laughs> yeah. um, Jerome, you, uh, you wrote this uh, fantastic piece uh, on mm. LinkedIn the value of the water cooler conversation and what to replace it with. And I think, you know, you've you've centered on and nailed, um, this was the, uh, the image on uh, which I just loved. The water cooler is probably one of the most important, iconic, 
physical things, you know, places, spaces in in a company, in an organization, not just for idle banter, for serendipity, for spontaneity, but also the place that the 30 second spot needed, which is to discuss what happened on Friends or Cheers or Seinfeld the night before. And on many levels, the water cooler has changed in its role. And then of course, there's the COVID uh, aspect to it. So I would love for you to set up the piece and talk a little bit about why the water cooler is just so important in interpersonal relationships in the workplace. Uh, and then obviously kind of what has happened to it since. Yeah, I mean, what prompted me to um, to write that piece was that, you know, a lot of clients have been telling us this, that, you know, they're, they're sort of, they're wondering how to engage employees, especially when they come in, but even in general, because there's a trem tremendous sense of isolation. And yes, you know, we're connecting right now and there's all these other opportunities that this has offered, which is, you know, we can work from anywhere um, and we can, you know, connect with people that perhaps we wouldn't have been able to connect with in the past. However, the big downside of this is that we no longer have a physical space to gather in. And as human beings, that's really important to us. You know, these are, you have a, an image there of, you know, people gathering around a campfire. The idea is to gather and you're gathering in person and you're gathering in a space. And what I realized about the water cooler is that this is a space that's outside of the formal office space. And it offers a way to gather in a way that's a little bit less formal and where perhaps your guard is a little bit let down. Because first of all, you're going to the water cooler because you need a glass of water and you need something, you know, but also because you need a break from what you've just done, you know. And for me, my life would have been completely di different if it were not for the water cooler, because it's really at the water cooler in my first job out of business school that I had my most meaningful conversations with people in terms of advancing my career. You know, and, and people would kind of tell stories about what they were working on, but also about their families. And for me, you know, I met I met someone at the water cooler who had been in the company that I was working in for 20 years. And she told me about a job opening uh, that was happening in Hong Kong. At this point in my life, I was working in Paris. I grew up in France and I was working in Paris and I'd been there for about three months and it was time for me to decide what to do next. And so I was talking to her about that. And she was a 20 year veteran in this company. So she knew all the ins and outs of this department that I was in. It was actually the marketing department of a, of a pretty big asset management um, firm within a large bank. So very big institution offices around the world. And she told me about this opening in Hong Kong. And, and within a month, I was talking to the right person in Hong Kong. And within three months, I was living in Hong Kong, um, you know, and, and stayed there for about five years until I came to New York. So, so, you know, in thinking about what's going on now and what people have told us at Narrative about the challenges that they're having around gathering people, connecting people with one another, not just about work, but just as human beings, that's what the water cooler was doing. You know, it helped people to just connect as human beings. And it would also help to gather information that was otherwise not being gathered. Right. So there's there's a lot of critical information that gets passed on at the water cooler, either complaints about leadership or successes that nobody knows about, big challenges that we're working on, big opportunities, things that are happening in our personal lives that leadership could actually use and act on and leverage. Right. And so these are all this is all part of the collective story of an organization. And a lot of times these conversations around the water cooler, they just get lost. They're not captured. And so that's kind of what prompted me to think, well, this is a, a very opportune time for people since we don't have a water cooler anymore. We're all you know, in these kind of uh, uh, Zoom spaces. Well, now it's a great time to actually gather stories as you would around the water cooler. Gather stories, listen to stories, ask people about other things that aren't just about work but ask them about their what they're, what's challenging right now about their life. What's a successful thing that's happened? Very much a little bit like you, you're setting up these, uh, you know, this show here where you're asking people about things that aren't just about the topic, right? You asked me about my personal life. That did something for me. It opened me up. It did something to my listening of you. And so as a result, I feel more trusting of you. And so for me, there was something about that, that, that the risk 
of losing the water cooler is kind of losing these conversations that build trust and that ultimately build the culture of the company. So how do you how do you replace that? You know, how how can we create such a such an atmosphere um, in in a in a setting that's like the one we're in now? And and obviously without you know without those stories you wouldn't be able to hear that Steve Garfield said Jerome Jerome is the best storyteller you've <laughs> ever had on the show. So now there's going to be a a, yeah. a, a celebrity death match between Murray Nossel and and, <laughs> and Jerome. Um, but but you well, know he's like, taught me everything I know. So you know I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, that was that was a good comeback. And and Chip says, how do you onboard a stalker? By the way, so uh, is. <laughs> Is there a stalker employee handbook? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, um, Tom Morris says the water cooler may be a, a, an analog of the great third place, neither work proper nor home. So it lives in that in that middle or that limbo. But but there's another interesting um, uh, connection point. And uh, I took this little snippet from your article. You said the leaders didn't come to our water cooler. And I thought, wow, that there's there's a lot in that statement in terms of being in touch, being connected, and really understanding the conversations that are going on that is essentially the epitome of life inside an organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's 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 interesting for me because. I, I don't necessarily fault the leaders for not coming to every water cooler in a huge institution, but it's more to me about gaining access to critical information and knowledge that you that you just don't have otherwise. If there, if there wasn't a water cooler, people wouldn't just be be passing along these stories. And within these stories, there's a, there's critical knowledge and information to be gathered and transferred to others for the sake of the organization and its ability to to learn and grow and and have a culture that's thriving essentially and the problem with the water cooler is that it's just put into a a corner there and we think that its only purpose is to go and get water and have a little chat with somebody and so the leaders are like well that's not worth looking at right um when actually that's that's the thing that's wrong is that it's everything is worth looking at what are the spaces in which people are having conversations in which they're listening to one another and in, and in which they're telling stories to one another. And usually those spaces are spaces in which they feel comfortable, they feel safe, and they feel like there's a sense of trust and a sense of belonging between them. And there's this kind of unwritten thing with the water cooler is that I'm taking a break from my from my computer. I'm taking a break from my boss. I'm going to go over here. This is a nice safe space for me within this organization. And I think that's what leaders are missing. They're missing that significance of that space. So, you know, that's kind of how I view things in terms of, of storytelling and listening is that it's, you know, you're telling stories and listening to stories within a particular space and leaders have the obligation, the responsibility to set up those spaces as, as environments in which people can feel like they can trust, like they can belong, et cetera, et cetera. All those things that make us feel like, yes, I can share something with you. Or, because the risk of not, you might, you may ask, you know, well, okay, but what's, you know, what's the big deal? You know, why do I need to actually share of myself at work? Why does my boss need to know about that? To me, it's not so much about that. It's more about feeling like, you know, we spend the majority of our lives at work. And so why not actually feel, why not create an environment in which people feel like they can bring 100% of themselves? Mm. You know? um, there's a crisis in America that's way before COVID, and I think in the world in general, where people aren't engaged at work. Half of the workforce says that they're not engaged at work. And I'm pretty sure that after this pandemic, when we'll be able to measure the impact of it on employee engagement, those stats are going to go up because people are feeling isolated and they're not connecting with one another and we're not adapting to it fast enough. Now, now when you say there's a crisis, employees are not engaged at work, why? Why, why are they not in, engaged at work? Well, you know, that I think one of the, the themes that I'm talking about here is precisely that, that, you know, there isn't that space for people to feel like I can bring 100% of myself at work. Right. I can, you know, I can talk about my stalker story with so and so, you know, I can talk to my boss about what my family dynamics are and how they're impacting 
my work right now and what a challenge it is, right? The problem is that people aren't uh, able to listen and to tell the right stories, the stories that need to be told and need to be listened to. And after a while, the more that happens, people aren't engaged. And what that means is that people leave and there's high turnover and it's hard to find people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's kind of this cycle that goes on and where leaders say, well, you know, another one bites the dust, we'll just find another person, right? Uh, but when you're in a market where talent is starting to become rare, that's no longer something you can afford to do, right? To just say, I'll replace somebody. So to me, that's where this lack of engagement comes from, is that there's a lack of a creation of environments in which people feel like they can, they really belong, you know, genuinely. It's not about getting free coffee or free lunch. Now you talk about this idea of a of a a, a place, a space, uh, where a safe place, where where stories can be told, where people have the time and the inclination to want to listen. And of mm -hmm. course, with that is spontaneity and serendipity, but also. Um, there is this idea of almost ordered chaos, which is the, um, it, it, uh, I mentioned this on the show before, I heard uh, Seth Meyers on Howard Stern talking about how as efficient and frictionless as this Zoom-enabled world has been, guess what? We can, in fact, operate remotely at home and do it quite efficiently, but, but at the same time, what we still need and what we miss and, and what is still part of this formula is the perfect the perfect imperfections you know the jokes sometimes in bad taste the the bumping into someone in the corridor and these um just almost superficial conversations around the water cooler and i think your point is they may be superficial what did you do a uh, lot on the weekend um did you get up to anything interesting hey can you believe the jets won finally but that is as much a part of the value and the power of business as being actually productive absolutely absolutely and it, it's it's interesting you're just reminding me uh, about two weeks ago, we facilitated a, a, a retreat for this organization and, you know, they had welcomed a lot of new people in. And so they were kind of using this as a uh, as a kickoff of sorts. And, and also it's the end of the year. So it was quite celebratory. And they're growing. And so they're quite happy with, with how things are going. But, you know, what we chose to do was rather than tell stories about, you know, the company and the great growth that they're experiencing, et cetera, which, you know, employees all know about, it was it was much more about you know, tell me stories about times for them. Um, you know, we had found these um, these themes about finding common ground, especially with people that you disagree with. And because you know, this was uh, right after the election, and you know, it's it's been such a polarizing number of years, not just four years, but everybody has opinions, and it's hard to kind of move away from that. And and this organization has conversations like that as part of their job, but we wanted to make it a little bit more personal. And so rather than, you know, talking about the successes of the stories or the challenge or of the company or the challenges, we asked them, you know, tell us stories about a time when you found common ground with someone or when you found a third option, when you thought there were just two options, you know, because it forces people to think about other people to kind of get outside of your head. And then because you're sharing it with someone else, just like what we're doing now, you know, you're in your breakout room when you're in your breakout room with someone else, it's just the two of you. It's no longer the hundred people in your company. And so that's what we're trying to create here is sort of create these little moments. They don't have to be very long. And the great thing about storytelling is that when you ask people to have a common theme around a common theme to tell stories, first of all, they think of their experiences. And then when they've got someone, a colleague in front of them in a, in a room, they start to think about that other person and they start to wonder, Oh, I wonder what he's got or what she's got or what they've got, you know? And so then they start to, a dialogue together and they start connecting in this way. And that's very different from our day-to-day -day kind of discourse. And the reason they're doing this is because we're hardwired for this stuff. And so the moment I start telling a story, you know, your brain starts to, its wires start to fire on all cylinders. And so as a result, we're connecting. And, and now I'm thinking about stories as a result of hearing your story. So it's this kind of dialogue that we're trying to create and that we are creating even in this world where we aren't able to gather in a physical space together. But the mere fact of listening and telling stories 
allows us to actually recreate a space. This is now considered a space that we're in. Like for me, there's no there's no more barrier. I, I'm almost like wanting to go across my computer into yours and just get a pina colada next to the beach there. <laughs> you know, that's and that, we can or, or, or come sit, or we're sitting around the campfire right now. Yes, um, exactly. Like I actually believe that. You know, there's there's some there's a suspense. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm suspending disbelief there. Th this has been a common theme. Um, across this journey and this experience, particularly through uh, the uh, Zoom after show, which you'll participate in um, afterwards. But mm -hmm. but let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about connecting with one another, specifically employees in the age of COVID. Um, yeah. And I think you've already um, because the question remains: What is the new water cooler? How how do we replace? The water cooler and i think you've already alluded to one of the um uh maybe let's call it a next practice or idea which mm. is this idea of little icebreaker uh breakout rooms and icebreaker questions yeah. i personally have found the most meaningful networking that i have uh, um, partaken in has been in small breakout rooms where you don't know who you're going to be put up uh, or put with and then a specific icebreaker question and it could be like talk about a time when you nearly died mm, like if you've yeah. ever had a near-death experience yeah yeah absolutely and you know what's interesting about that is that you know you 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 use it as an icebreaker that's kind of your entry into this and and it's also you know it's not threatening at all it's not intimidating this is an icebreaker and we all understand what an icebreaker is and there's an agreement that okay we're going to do this as an icebreaker and then we all have the same question to respond to. So already there's a kind of a leveling of the playing field and we're and you're asking people to go back into an experience of theirs that's their unique experience of that near death experience or of finding common ground or that third option that I was talking about earlier. But then what's really critical is what you do after that. You know, because now you've kind of opened people up and they're feeling that connection with one another. And you know, you get out of these breakout rooms and now people are kind of gathering around on a much larger zoom you know and there's many more faces and so what's critical here for me and that's kind of what we do now and, and where it ties back into engagement and onboarding is to actually gather the information that came out of those stories and ask people to actually reflect on the stories that not the ones that they told but the ones that they heard right and and then ask the people you know everyone who heard stories just to reflect on those stories and see you know what did you get from that like what's something that how does that tie back in to the mission the vision and the values of the company right so you're kind of going back to that because as a leader that's you know there's really important information that you can gather not only about your people as human beings but about your culture and and that information can then be transferred to the new people in the organization, right? Some of those near-death experiences that you're talking about could be a fantastic way to introduce people to your organization, you know, if it hits on those right values that you have to begin with, right? That's kind of what I'm always about is trying to, what are these stories for, you know, is, and for me, the biggest thing is, is about, you know, shared values within an organization. Every organization has them. They all has, they all have values. They all have a vision. They all have a mission. Usually it's on a wall in a space or it's on a, a worst case so yeah, scenario, it's on it's in a branding deck in somebody's drawer, you know, and it never came out um, or it's on some kind of deck somewhere. But or in the not handbook, everybody, of course. What's that? Or in the handbook on page. Or in the handbook, exactly. Yes, exactly. So, you know, I, I remember it from my first 48 hours in the company, but then a week or two later, I don't remember what those are because well, I'm not seeing them in action, you know, and that's the thing that stories can do and where I think we have a responsibility as leaders is to gather those stories and match them up with those values and see if they actually match up or if you're actually creating a new set of values for yourself. So that's where it's kind of this living, breathing thing. Well, you, you mentioned the, the magic uh, C word, which is your quote of the episode, uh, pay attention to your culture and your hires from the very beginning. Mm. Uh, and that uh, was said by Reid Hoffman, um, mm. Mm. From LinkedIn. Yeah. And, and and I mean, I think there are a couple of things to unpack with that statement, right? Which is culture, the mesh of culture, new hires, and the key 
moment in time, which is from the get-go. Very simple uh, formula that he seems to have very eloquently and succinctly communicated to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's great, and, and he's got a great podcast too. Uh, but you know, it's it's yes for me ultimately everything you're doing and this is the great opportunity that there is now in this in this pandemic because of you know not having physical spaces and working remotely is that there's an opportunity for us to gather people in such a way that it actually impacts our culture and really to pay attention to our culture uh you know and I, by our culture i mean the culture of an organization you know and sort of looking at you know what are the ins and outs of this culture what makes our company what it is and when you go down to it, what it is, it's the people that make up your company, that make up your culture. And so it's really important to pay attention to what they're saying. What are the stories that they're saying to one another about the company, about this culture, about these values? What are the values that they have that they don't feel are represented in this company? Or what are the values of this company that they don't feel are represented at all in this company where you're not walking the talk essentially? And so for me, these, these groups that you're creating, these icebreakers, these smaller gatherings that you're creating, they, they must have a point, right? And they must have a purpose. And I think that purpose of building culture and maintaining culture and having a culture that thrives is a great purpose to have for stories. And that's why I even intentionally, you know, said it sounds so superficial and innocuous and almost like a throwaway, but it is so critical because it is that first impression. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so you you've you know you've focused a big part of the business is storytelling for employee uh, onboarding. You conduct these workshops. Um, I have a a little clip of uh, of uh, an excerpt from one of them which you can comment on. But I think the way I would set this up is is very simply, which is to recognize that just like the story of. Uh, you know, James Short or Martin Short, or I don't know, one of the shorts. James, yes, James, James and Munro. <laughs> and Munro. <laughs> um, but it is about understanding who has come before you um, and, and where you're heading. It is very dynamic, this moment in time, where the past, the present, and the future all collide uh, together. So I'll show this clip and then uh, ask you to comment on it. Great. When people start a new job, especially at a research organization, they're thinking, okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read the methodology, but I'm not going to hear stories about how this organization is affecting people in the real world every day. Training is always boring and it's always staged and it always seems just very fake. For the first time it was, I knew these stories were real and they just felt like they were resonating with me in a way that training hadn't before. The reason this training is really important for me as a leader is that I used to, when we hired new members of the data outreach team, I would just have them come shadow me. And then they would sort of over time evolve into doing that work on their own. But right now, it's just not realistic that every data outreach member gets to shadow me. I was excited to hear more and I felt the stories that were being told were gonna to be helpful even prior to going out and getting the experience out in the field. So this way they can hear about my experiences, how it shaped the role of a data outreach team member, and then once they go on the road, they have some of my knowledge in their brain. I see almost this Venn diagram of these three components. One is understanding the company, its culture, its purpose, its past, its vision, its mission. The second clearly are tools for the trade and 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 aspects of the job and what you'll need to be successful. Mm. But then the third piece are the people and the mm. stories uh, in their lives that make them who they are and provides that color commentary and context in terms of understanding them a little bit, you know, from a human standpoint. Yeah, yeah. yes, I mean, that's beautifully put. Uh, you know, the, the only thing I would just build on there is that to me, you know, this is all the common denominator between those three things that you just mentioned, um, you know, the mission, the values, et cetera, what makes up the company and then the, the people is the third and, and in between is the, what are the tools of the trade. And, and to me, what, what underlines all of that is knowledge, right? And so the key is how do we pass knowledge on? 
how do we transfer that knowledge from, you know, in this case, Caroline, who was on uh, in that clip, she's the leader and she's been there, you know, for 10 years and she started out, it was just her on the road every day till that company grew. And then there's, now she's got a team and it's growing and it's growing. And so she said, okay, well, you just can come with me on the road and that's, that'll be your training. But now there's too many people. I can't do that anymore. So how do I pass on my knowledge? Not only of how I do my job, but my knowledge of this organization, what it means to me, what its mission means to me, what, what kind of impact it's had on the customers it serves, you know, and all of, of those things are stories that she has, you know, and they're stories about people. That's the third element. So yes, I, I agree completely with you that those are, those are the elements, but you have to be aware of the fact that what you're doing is simply taking knowledge and passing it on from another person. And that the best way to do that for our human brains is to do that through stories. And hopefully through stories of people that you trust and that you feel are like you. And that's why, you know, I love in that clip when she says uh, training is always boring because it's it's kind of, in, 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 you know, interesting to me and humorous that as a training company, we would put that up in a clip, you know, the training is always boring. And hey, you want to do a training with us? And And the reason it's there and I love it is because it's true, you know, that most people when they enter a company, they know they're going to have to go through this really boring stuff and that they're going to have to learn all this stuff about the company that's not that engaging. And why is it boring is because no one has actually put the the their their intention, you know, what their intention is with all that material. It's more like, you know, I've got this training video from the 80s, let me just pop it into the thing and, you know, you'll just go through that and then next week we'll talk and you know, finally you'll get to do your job. But why not just cut to the chase and be like, okay, here are the people in the company and they're the ones who are gonna tell you stories. It's not me, it's not Jerome, the trainer at Narrative, the great storyteller. I'm not the one telling stories. I can't be, I have to get out of the way. It has to be about them. And, and my only job is to help them tell their stories, the stories that are the most on point and that are the taking this knowledge that's critical, recognizing what that knowledge is that you wanna pass on and then finding the stories, and then you tell the stories. It's your job to do that. So, uh, Jerome, or, or maybe I should say, you know, I've decided to re rename you. You're now Jerome. First impressions, <laughs> um, right? <laughs> picking, picking, picking. Um, you know, you do these workshops. I think one of the very cool things uh, is that there is the ability for people uh, to sign up for one of these workshops, yes. um, I will go ahead and uh, and put that up here. You can uh, there, and in fact, I'll here. post I'll post the link as well. You can sign up for a very special virtual workshop on how to demonstrate your values as a leader through uh, storytelling. There, there's a lot to be said about leading with your story, and 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 uh, and and I think people just listening to you and Murray from the previous episode, it's so obvious. Um, but let's just take one step back for a moment and yeah. and talk about um, that that continuation of what Murray and I discussed, which was um, the power of listening and 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 the power of stories. What stories need to be told right now? Where are the gaps in terms of the kind of content and the kinds of stories that we sorely sorely need uh, to replace and 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 replenish? Mm. Well, you know, for me, and and I think Murray would say the same thing, um, and anyone at Narrative really, uh, is that it begins with listening. And to me, it's kind of like who needs to be listened to. Uh, you know, this methodology was born during the AIDS epidemic in New York City when Murray was working with a group of uh, of people with AIDS, uh, a program that took care of people with AIDS, and you know, they needed to be listened to. That's what he provided to them. And they needed to be listened to as humans because no one else was listening. And because he listened to them, they started telling stories that were very human and that were being taken out of this label of I've got AIDS or I've got HIV or I'm you know, um, uh, a marginalized person. Um, and these stories, they really created this kind of uh, commonality between between people and people started as these stories got told outside of this program you know when they when they started to find their voice and tell their own stories for advocacy purposes people started to listen to those stories and see them differently right so for me the question is who needs to be listened to right now and i think that when it comes to businesses leaders have a responsibility to listen 
to their employees and get out of the way, right? It's uh, I think it's Simon Sinek who's got a, a book called Leaders Eat Last or something like that. And um, you know, and, and it's true, it's the idea is that you know, as a leader, you have to sort of get out of the way and get other people, um, you know, get other people's voices to be heard, and you have to listen to those voices. And then and only then can you start telling stories that are relevant, right? But you know, for me, when I look at society as a whole, certainly, you know, stories of diversity, you know, seeing seeing diversity, representation is hugely important, has been hugely important for years and years and years. But finally, people seem to be, you know, uh, paying attention, right? And that's, again, kind of where narrative started, you know, working with marginalized pop populations, the people who weren't being heard, who weren't being listened to. It's always been kind of our mission for us to raise those voices, because when we can raise all those voices, even in organizations, this may, this may seem like I'm talking about society at large, but in organizations, it's so essential to raise all the voices that you can, because you don't know who's got the next fantastic idea that's going to get your company to the next level. You know, it's probably not your CEO or your VP or whatever, if that's if you haven't had a great idea in the last you know year or so. So so that's kind of to me, that's that's how I would answer that question is it starts with listening. And who do you need to really listen to that you haven't been listening to? I see two very interesting, um, almost a, a one two punch. The first is you reference this idea of leveling the playing field, right? That's what the icebreaker does. It brings everyone, everyone's got a story. It doesn't matter whether you are the CEO or someone who works in the mailroom. And so the playing field is leveled, but then you bring it home. Well, first of all, you said then it doesn't stop there. Mm -hmm. So what actually really happens next is, is this concept, a very powerful idea that you just mentioned, which is this idea of raising, the rising tide floats all boats, but raising not just every voice, but very specific voices. And I think the dot, 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 why this counts, why this matters is because the security of people to be able to talk, to, to raise their hands, to contribute, not only adds to the perspective and the diversity to the opinion and the, even the brainstorming process, but I think, as you say, may come up with the next million or billion dollar idea. So it's mm -hmm. not even just about the right thing to do. I think there's a business case, a very powerful one too. That, that's really the point I'm, I'm making. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to me, it, it makes complete business sense to be uh, as diverse as possible and have as much representation as possible in, in a corporation because everyone has different backgrounds, different cultures, different sets of values. In, in, and I don't even mean in terms of race and ethnicity, uh, only and and demographics, but really just in terms of ways people think and where they come from, what their education's been. You know, you really want that diversity because those those are you know we're we're molded by you know by our education, by our our upbringing, by the stories that we've been told about ourselves. You know, I mean the story about Monroe and James Short. I mean that's something that I'm taking something from that. You know. And, uh, and and same with all the stories that have happened through my life, right? And everybody has that. So I feel like the more you can rep have representation, the more it'll make sense business-wise because you'll be getting ideas that you yourself wouldn't be able to have simply because you just don't have that kind of access. Well, you'll see how your two stories from your fun facts continue to, to rise. Uh, Tom Morris has created the Ballad of James and Monroe uh, the boy and dad were pods, then came the cards, a man was shot down and made to leave the town, and that sort of cut the family. <laughs> Beautiful. People like wanting to sing the ballad of Jack and Diane. Um, uh, you know, it, it's so funny. Yesterday, Leslie came to the uh, Zoom after show, and she just said, I'm just here to listen. It's the first time someone had said that, and I think that just really um, uh, dials up uh, the legend of Murray, um, which is which is the security of uh, to come and say I don't need to be heard I don't need to be the star I don't need to have the spotlight I'm just here to listen and I'm just here to learn and and Leslie who we affectionately call she affectionately calls herself the sales lady um, she said stories also need to be told by sales teams mm -hmm. marketing should replace their case studies and use case scenarios with stories yeah yeah absolutely I mean I think that's you know a lot of 
a lot of the teams that we work with are, are sales teams and and you know that's kind of what we're helping them to realize and recognize is that you know you can come in with with those case studies and you know the fancy features of your product or service and why they're so great but if you don't have a story that kind of demonstrates what it is what's the challenge there what's that pain point to use a sales term you know but what's that thing that you're actually it's been really difficult because your product or service has not existed you know and what it is that it's coming to do but i need to understand it as the story unfolds as opposed to you just kind of imposing your solutions on me without having actually heard what my challenges are what my pain points are and I think one of the things that salespeople can do is they can tell stories about challenges and pain points. And, and that will help their clients and customers kind of realize, oh yeah, that's right. That is a challenge that, you know, you're making me think of something that's not exactly that challenge, but let me tell you about this other thing that goes on in my enterprise. And maybe we can talk about that. And, you know, most of the job of a salesperson is to listen. A good one is to really listen. Well, you know, we we have uh, the ballad of the ballad of James and Monroe. We have the legend of Murray, uh, but Murray uh, Murray just said, "Brilliant question. Who needs to be listened to right now?" It's an invitation to open doors, mm -hmm. uh, which others aren't seeing. So yeah. he's definitely complimenting you um, <laughs> because I asked what what stories need to be told, and Murray said, "Ah ah ah." <laughs> What's going to be heard right now? Yeah, um, yeah. And um, I just love the ability to almost replace everything we hold to be true with the word listen. You mm -hmm. know, ask a question, listen a question, tell a story, listen a story. Yeah. Um, and recognize the power of the other person in the room. Um, and, mm -hmm. and so uh, kudos to you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, and you know, it's a great, I think it's a great life um sort of tool you know if you approach everything this way you know it's great for relationships it's it's great for all human interactions you know and and i think that if you approach it as saying all right who do i who do i need to listen to right now i've got a four-year-old a wife and an eight-month-old you know not far from here and so i'm going to come out of this room after this and thinking all right who do i need to listen to first you know because because there'll be some attention there but you know i'm being facetious but i think I think that's it's a great way to even just prioritize in your own mind because everything is so overwhelming at the moment and you know we are in a crisis mode we're we're adapting if people are pivoting and we're adjusting and we're kind of reinventing if we have that luxury you know and others are in dire straits you know they they their livelihoods are gone and so that's very overwhelming and it creates a, a pretty big obstacle to listening right when you think about it it's it's hard to even think um, and so when you start to approach things by just saying, who, what is it that I need to listen to? Is it me? Do I need to listen to myself right now? What is that voice that I'm not hearing? Is it my wife Do I need, or my husband? Do I need to listen to him or her? Do I need to listen to my son, my daughter? You know, I think that's, it kind of gets us a little bit out of this spiral that a lot of us are feeling right now. Uh, I think that almost it's a, uh, just before we get uh, and wind down, this idea of obstacles to listening, mm -hmm. we can maybe talk about that in the after show. But I think sure. also, as as kind of brought to light in this in 2020, where so many people are going through, just like just like COVID itself, where some people can be asymptomatic and others not, mm -hmm. um, it is there has to be some kind of of safe place where the fields are leveled in order to truly engage in in deep you know empathic uh listening and and storytelling and so uh this is probably a good segue to the corona question this week which is mm -hmm. what is the one silver lining if any because i don't want to be presumptuous that you'll take away from 2020. Hmm. well i i mean i i maybe i have two uh you know, one, just on a personal note, uh, you know, I, I, I welcomed a new baby in a, on April 22nd. And that oh, was the peak. Thank you. That was the peak of the pandemic, uh, the first wave in, in New York City. And, uh, and so I feel really, you know, extremely um, blessed and just um, overwhelmed just by that, that that's been the silver lining throughout 
that every time, you know, I can just go back to this precious being. Uh, but the second thing too, is just on a more professional level or career level, you know, it, is that it has opened up doors in terms of the way we think about our interactions with, with our clients, you know, and one of the first things we did was to run uh, a workshop around, you know, storytelling in, in, in a time of isolation. Um, and we offered that for free, you know, and, and people came from all over the world. And, and suddenly we had these new connections that we would never have made, uh, you know, by running a workshop in person in, in New York City, which is what we had planned to do. I think it was March 15 was the date. It was the day of the lockdown, the first lockdown in New York, uh, March 18, that we were going to do an in-person workshop. And we quickly replaced it um, and found this kind of theme that we all felt was the right theme and the right tone. And all these people showed up. And so and that's kind of been the theme throughout is that there's people are showing up in ways that I hadn't expected, thanks to technology. Um, and, you know, we're finding new and creative ways to use storytelling and listening through technology, which has its own set of challenges, but also great opportunities. So that's that's definitely been a, a silver lining. Beautiful soundbite, this idea of people are showing up in surprising and unexpected ways because of that ease of that low barrier to entry, um, yeah. fantastic yes. little nuggets. Low barrier to entry, exactly, yeah. Well, well uh, Jerome, uh, <laughs> Roy, CEO of Narrative, um, you know, I, I'm not going to rest until every single person at Narrative has come on the show because now <laughs> we've got a good thing going. It is all about continuity, the ability to tell stories at the end of the day, and it is no different in a corporate environment, in an employee engagement or onboarding environment, and certainly in the age of COVID. Uh, you can follow Jerome and his company, Narrative, on Twitter, at Jerome DeRoy, at Narrative. You can connect with him on LinkedIn. You can follow Narrative on the Instagram. And of course, you can find out more about both him and the company at narrative.com. And finally, sign up for a a special virtual workshop. Be one of those surprising and unexpected uh, guests at the party and uh, and the new virtual water cooler. Uh, Jerome, mm -hmm. thank you for uh, spending December twenty third with me. When uh, when everybody is winding down, we're going strong, and uh, you'll join us uh, for a little bit of time in the Zoom after show. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You're, you. you're welcome. And final word, of course, always goes to uh, Mr. Chuck Norris. You are Chuck Norris approved. There you go. <laughs> Love it. I'll see you guys tomorrow on my birthday. Thank you for watching Corona TV with your host, multiple author and global keynote speaker, Joseph Jaffe. Corona TV is the show about hope, positivity, optimism, and if there's time left over, a little bit of marketing. The after show on Zoom starts right now at bit.ly slash Corona TV after show. If you like the show, tell a friend or two. Please subscribe to the show at coronatv.show. And if you want to get inside news, previews of upcoming guests, and much more, text Corona TV to 66866 or visit josephjaffe.com slash subscribe to sign up for the show's newsletter. And despite the best ministrations of your wife, you still look ugly. <laughs>